Jupiter Broadcasting presents this show in mega stereo sound. This episode of the Linux Action Show brought to you in part by GoDaddy.com. Use the promo code Linux and save yourself some cash. And of course, from donations of people that are, it's like people get donated, you know? And it's free. It's free. It's tax, it's tax exempt. No, it's not. No, when you donate people, it is. It's tax. Right. You can't, Chris, you can't put a worth on person. This week. On the Linux Action Show, Aaron Saigo joins us to talk about the new open source KDE powered tablet that he and his team are working on. Find out how hard you want one after this week's episode. Plus, Canonical drops Kubuntu, Microsoft throws its weight around, and we bust some Raspberry Pi rumors. And so much more. Oh, this week. On the Linux Action Show! And welcome to Season 20, Episode 6 of the Linux Action Show. My name is Brian, that guy to the left of me, or to the right of me, depending on your particular orientation in the world, is Chris. Hey there, Brian. BT Vision will soon run Linux. Now, do you know what BT Vision is, B-Man? I don't. Well, it's a UK TV service, and they have these set-top boxes out there that run the Microsoft Media Room software on them, and it's just been a total train wreck. Total train wreck. So check this out. It sounds like a train wreck already. They now have, BT Vision now has an ambitious plan to, over the internet, upgrade a half a million customers running the Windows CE-based Microsoft Media Room with a Linux variant that has a browser, and it's going to give them uh, access to online media and all kinds of stuff. Boom. Customers just one day go from running a Windows set-top box, wake up, they're running a Linux set-top box. You're welcome. That's awesome. You're welcome, England. Welcome to the 21st. 21st? 21st? Uh, 20, 22nd? Uh, yeah. 22nd century. Yeah, yeah. You know what's crazy? What? It's like 2012. I don't think I've said the phrase 22nd century yet. It threw me recently when I had to do it, yeah. I don't think I've ever said that before. But you know, then you can start doing like, it's the 22nd freaking century. Come on. Dude. Right? That sounds so great coming out of my mouth. <laughs> I know. I know. I All know. right, Chris. B-Man. Yeah. I have got some hell of a good yeah, pick B-man. You really do because I demanded that you pick yeah, it. Was, yeah. yeah, it was actually... Yeah, I like, was like, Chris, you have to pick this app for, for freak's sake. You were like, hey, have you, ever, have you ever featured this app? And I was like, B-Man, B-Man, I haven't featured that app. That has been a major oversight. So major we are oversight. going to cover that major. in just a moment. But before we do that, we need to say good morning to the fine folks at Danica Patrick. <laughs> over at GoDaddy.com. Now, B-Man, I got something I've been holding. I, I, was, I decided I wasn't going to tell you this before uh-huh. we started the show. I was going to save it for you. Okay. But, you know. Uh, You're holding on to this. Danica's been real busy uh, with the Super Bowl. Real, she, she sure has. Real busy, Brian. Yeah. yeah. And, I've uh, been real busy with Danica being real busy with the Super Bowl. Let me, let me tell you. So right, tell me. I get this email message from Danica now that she's not so busy. And it's yeah. one of these, I hate it when people put the entire message of the email in the subject line. So and she does she does that frequently and I'm like oh, tell me about and it and I'm like Tanica, it's like she's tweeting with you in email well it's like I think it's just some people just aren't maybe fully familiar with email uh, uh, I don't know I just, a lot of people do it right yeah and here's what the subject line said it's just a couple of words is Brian Polly question mark and I have no idea what that means I was wondering if you yeah have, no don't you know? know what that means so I think it means she wants you to get a website and when you get a website with a domain name over at GoDaddy.com use our code Linux is Brian Polly dot info sure yeah, yeah dot biz Dot biz. Is Brian Polly dot TV. <laughs> and, uh, that would be uh, the so best. I, I bet they would show that over in the UK on Linux based boxes. I'm just kind of wondering what's going on between you and Danica. I got to get to the bottom of that. But, well, uh, she keeps tweeting me. Thanks to GoDaddy tweeting, 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 tweeting. for their long time support of the Linux Action Show. And also, they've got a deal going on right now. If you go to uh, GoDaddy and want to get yourself some of them uh, fine, fine hosting that they've got over I there at GoDaddy.com, do. you know, Brian. They got the deluxe package right now. That's the big boy package. They got the big boy package that you can pick up for the economy price right now. It's only for the month of February. So you've got to use our very special February only code, which is also in the show notes, but it's host 
Feb seven to get big big boy hosting for the price big of a boy economy. hosting. Get the, I, I, I get tell the you, deluxe. So get the I, deluxe. I run my I run a bunch of stuff. I run my blog off of that deluxe hosting plan. I run my my web comic off that hosting plan. And I'm gonna tell you straight up, this is not like Mr. Braggy Pants or nothing. Mm -hmm. Those websites get a crap ton of traffic. And they hold up dandy. Yeah. For nothing. I don't for like dollars. Dude, it's all you can eat traffic. I used to have them hosted over at some one like, you know, pretty rack or whatever yeah, the heck yeah. I was hosting at. Yeah. I was paying like 120 bucks a month for a dedicated server rig for those guys. Yeah. Ridiculous. I pay like five bucks a month now. Totally fine. I love that some of the chat room is is Oh well. Uh, all right. We'll we'll cover that off there because uh, they're talking about They're talking about polygamy now. Yeah, yeah. They're talking about polygamy in the chat room. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> all right, B Man. Well, I've got a great app pick for you this week because you picked it, and it is called Comic Rack. And if you don't have yes. this on your Android uh, device, you're wrong. What, what are you doing? You're doing it wrong. What are you doing? I mean, it's free, people. It's a free comic book app. <laughs> Both Brian and I go for the tablets. That I whip, I whip mine on. out here for the video <laughs> version here. I'll show you my little HTC yeah. seven inch flyer. Boom. Well, it's a little one. comic rack. Pull this guy up here. Boom. Right there. I like that. I, I still it have it. I still have the shot set up for text map. I apologize. Glorious there guys. You go. There I you mean, go. The, here we go. It has a great UI for organizing all your comics. Like and, I have and on you're here. Picky, you're picky about your comic app. Oh hell yes! I literally I bought four paid comic applications for my little Android tablet here. Mm -hmm, they mm -hmm. all were awful, just plain awful. There's a couple of free ones, awful. And people, a lot of people use the the various free ones out there, and they say, oh, it works pretty good. It doesn't. Well, the if one I've really linked to is the free. Well, there, yeah, you can buy Comic Rack for eight bucks, but the one I'm linking to is the free version. You can get it for free. Come on, eight bucks. Yeah, I know. Eight bucks. There's no ads. But you know what I did? Here's See, what here's, I look at. That. You got ads at the bottom. Yeah, there's a little. See, ad. there's the thing. Now click yeah. on click on the thing. Go full screen there. I don't think the ads there when you go full screen. Oh, is it just when you're? When yeah, you're yeah, the... it's, yeah. See, when you're reading, oh, you're, when you're okay. reading, check out. This oh, is such an awesome so Star Trek comic too. You know what I did? That is a good one. Is actually. I pointed <laughs> this because you can just have it look at a. You can have it look for CBZ files on a an, on an SD card. Yeah. So I just pointed this to look at the same directory that my Dropbox caches my comics yep. folder to. And so every folder, every comic I put in Dropbox, I can now get access Dude, to in this. You nailed it. Yeah. That is exactly how you do it. It's sweet. So now, I mean, I, I did that at first on mine, but my, my comic book collection is ginormous. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. I, so I have to go ahead and do it the manual way. But mm -hmm. honestly, you can point it at any folder you want. Yeah. It indexes it. It thumbnails it. It keeps track of where you're at in every comic book. Well, it's still, it does a great job. And you could also just you know mount it and just move the files over the SD That's card. That's what I do. Yeah. yeah. And, and and it it does it has no problem handling just hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of comic books that I've read through on it just glorious. So it's that's uh, great. Comic Rack for smooth, Android, fast, awesome. And uh, you can find a link to Comic Rack for Android in the show notes. All right, B man, you ready for the next pick here that we've got? It might be. So so this one is is kind of an interesting one. Uh, this has been around for a while. It's called Sandbox Game Maker or Sandbox Free 3D Game Maker, depending on how you want to say the name All right. of it. And it's actually pretty cool. Their website is a bit on the atrocious side. I'm not going to lie. It's it's kind of hard to, to browse through. It's short on information and then long on information when like it doesn't a, need to be. Is this like Minecraft, only higher no, res? No, I mean, no, what no. is this? Kind of in a way. So the 3D Game Maker really allows you to make 3D games, real 3D games. So basically, you get a 3D world, you get a little point in the side of the world. I kind of recommend that you watch the video tutorials on oh, okay. it. Okay. So uh, little, they're only right. like three or four minutes long, but it'll give you a better idea of what you can do there. Okay. Basically, you can get a cursor. You can say, you know what? Put a block over here, put a house over there, import some 3D models that I downloaded for free online and put them over here, attach some functionality to each of them, and you can build a shooter, you can build a role playing game, you can build a. Uh, Mario 64 style uh, run and jump adventure platformer game. You can build pretty much anything with it. And they did a really nice job on it. It's got some rough spots around the edges, but if you want to play with making 3D games and little 3D environments, it's a great way to go. Yeah. The thing I think is cooler than anything about this is you can do it multiplayer. So Chris and I could log into the oh. same world at once and collaboratively build our world at the same time. So you could really build a complete role-playing game with multiple people all working on different parts of the world, working on the same parts of the huh, world. This looks really together. cool, dude. It's it's really cool. They did a great job with it. Um, I, I highly recommend checking it out if you like that sort of thing. It, it's very, very cool. Yeah. All right. There's the first pick. Now, the second pick is the uh, random distro of the day. Yeah. And uh, the one you put in here, uh, it's it's a it's an offshoot, right? It's an offshoot of the one that we always give lots of love, but we never use. Yeah, it's Puppy. puppy. <laughs> it's Puppy. This is an offshoot of Puppy Linux. And I got to be honest, this is not random. Someone recommended this to me. 
Uh, well, that's this fine. is not this is not up on DistroWatch. This is not. In fact, they don't really have a great website. You got to go to this guy, <laughs> scottjarvis.com he, uh, slash page 105.htm. <laughs> I'm not joking. That is the web page for this this distribution. It's called Puppy Arcade 10. And it literally I like is, that he gets right to business though with the screenshots. Dude, he does. And it's such a great distro. It is a distro that boots up automatically in 800 by 600 and stays 800 by 600. <laughs> the whole point of this distribution is to emulate as many arcade and console video game systems as possible. Wow. And it has nice front ends for it. It has ROM downloaders for it. It has uh, you know, custom joystick uh, configuration scripts to make it work pr- a single joystick work properly across all the emulators. It's got a full screen launcher to launch different ones uh, eat quite easily. This is cool. The yeah. idea is if you want to build your own custom arcade video game cabinet, an emulator cabinet, th- this, this just there. stick this in there. Cool. Boom, away you go. Cool. It's a live CD. Yeah. Throw all your ROMs on there, which of course you've obtained legally. Right. By backing them off of the cartridges put directly. Them, you know, put it onto a flash drive, yeah. stick it in somewhere, boom, you've got everything you want. Rock and, and roll coaster, Brian. did a Brian. really nice job with it. It's, it's, it's incredible. Honestly, this should be up on DistroWatch, because it really should be right there. It should be, it should be on DistroWatch. Linux Mint, Ubuntu, Sousa, Puppy Arcade 10. Maybe it's the uh, fact In terms that, of, yeah. I love goodness. the... <laughs> it's not, look at this thing with that screen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why that's it's in there. Just some, it's just some weird looking guy with gigantic ears and really yeah. huge nose. It's okay. awesome. All right. Well, but then, anyway, it's yeah. very cool. Okay. Well, but now, very random. We've got a bunch of show to get into. We've got news coming up, and then the second half of the show, Aaron yeah. Saigo is going to join us. He Talking might... about the KDE tablet. Yeah. 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 I'm looking forward Powerhouse. to Powerhouse. So, all right, B Man, let's do the news. What's new in the news this week? All right, Brian. Thanks for letting me swallow. You're welcome. I had to give you a little extra time there. The top story in the news docket for this week. Is it really news so much? No, no. No, here, here's the thing. Some guy was talking to another guy, and that guy made a comment that says, and I quote, you want to scroll down a little bit here? Let's get the exact quote. And I quote, this is from Joris Evers, That's a great name. the director of corporate communications over at Netflix. And he says, and I quote, there are no plans to support Netflix on Linux. This is a random quote from a random guy. This does not mean... No, he's not super <clears throat> random. He's the director of corporate ne- uh, communications at Netflix. Yeah, but his, his first name is Joris. So, <laughs> okay. uh, I, don't, I don't mean that derogatorily. It just sounds random to me. Yeah. Um, but it doesn't mean we will never see Netflix available uh, running on a Linux platform. It also doesn't mean that we are going to. Well, Brian, uh, we already have... It kind of sounds a little negative. We already have Linux running... We already have Netflix running on a Linux platform. You've got your, you got your Android tablets. Yeah, I, got it, I do that every day here. You got your Chrome OS notebooks. Yep, yep, yep. So, uh, you and got, you got a lot of... Lot, lot of uh, your boxy boxes. The boxy boxes your running TiVos. Linux. The TiVos your, running Linux. Your yep. Roku. Yep. So we have it. It's just what people are talking about is a native plugin for browsers on desktop Linux. That's what they're talking about. It wasn't about. the rumor that originally... So this rumor... So it's funny because the rumor was started by OMG Ubuntu and now it was being resolved by OMG Ubuntu. I always love it when yeah. the Mac rumor sites do that too. Yeah. There's going to be an iPad that does this. And then they like three months later, oh, that was just a rumor. Well, yeah. Uh, but they the rumor, I believe, went something to the effect of it's going to be a Chrome app. plugin. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I honestly... You know, I, you got to figure maybe Netflix looks at it from a stats standpoint and says, well, we see a very low usage on uh, Linux users on our website, so we don't see a need to support them. Here's, here's but it's the like thing. chicken and the egg right there. Yeah, it's totally chicken and the egg. And honestly, I don't actually care if I get it for desktop Linux. No, I, I want things for desktop <laughs> Linux. What? But like, I want to use my tablet and my TV to watch the Netflix. Here's the biggest like, I don't issue. want to sit at my computer or at my laptop and watch the Netflix. No, I hear you. Well, like, although, so for my usage points, I don't care if I have a, a Windows or a Mac, a Mac-based PC or a Linux PC. I'm still not going to do it there. It's I nice, want it though, somewhere else. It, a, it's nice to have the option when you're working to put up a little stupid Yeah, no, that TV. is nice. Uh, yeah, that but, is nice. But B, the other biggest blocker is, is, the, is, the, is the effing fact that it, it makes Linux significantly disadvantaged as a home entertainment PC. No, that's the truth. And that's the only you spot co- you that You combine that with lack of bl- Blu-ray support, Yeah, and, and Linux has two major knocks against it. Now, uh, 
I, you know, a lot of us who'd be using it in that kind of configuration have ways around not having access to Netflix. We do, yeah. But it's a big disappointment. Uh, or we're the kind of people that are just going to get a boxy box anyway. I guess or something like that. I, I just cannot believe that the some of the apps out there and devices that have like think about some of these poor selling uh, HTC phones that have done really well, yeah. done really bad in this last year. Yeah, they all do Netflix. There's probably less people using those devices yeah. than there are running Linux. It's, it's a larger crowd they're ignoring. I've got to believe it's some that sort of... That is kind of silly, isn't it? Yeah, it's yeah. got to be some sort of DRM-related thing. It's got to be. Or, I, or, or a talent thing. They need to get the right people hired. To Could be. Build. But if it's a Chrome plug, like they were doing for the Chromebook. Uh, yeah, but it's, there's still going to be some native stuff. It's not going to be just for Chrome. I mean, there's still. I mean, it's going to be a native plug. It's not like you're going to write a, a JavaScript-based Netflix video decoder. That's just not going to work. Right. I don't care how fast some people claim JavaScript is. It's just not that fast. We need the community to get their hands on the Chromebooks and then dissect how they do it there. You know what I mean? Because like Metal Freak in the chat room is pointing yeah, out. it's still going to be closed source code that's going to be native on the Chromebook plugins. It just bugs me. Like Netflix, their back end runs on Linux. I just hate what... Yeah, how- they should have it available. I, I guess all I'm saying is I'm not... Like, it doesn't hurt me any, but I wish they would. Yeah. You know yeah. what I mean? So it's like, well, I don't know. I just... Yeah, whatever. Why don't we talk about this next story? Because I bet a few people out there were really bummed for for uh, <laughs> for at least a couple of days. A couple yeah. of different sites. Big sites were reporting that the Raspberry Pi wouldn't be purchasable until the end until, of the year. Until, basically, well, until after the, sec- until the second half or the end of the second quarter, depending on yeah, who you're yeah, at. Okay. So, so, yeah. So, one of the guys who works in the Raspberry Pi project was going around talking, and he got misquoted and kind of misunderstood, and what got reported by Tom's Hardware dot, ours dot and, edu and ours yeah. and a bunch of other places was basically, yeah, that you weren't going to be able to get the Raspberry Pi, quote-unquote, commercially until the second quarter or the second half, depending on who you read. Well, here's what it is. No, that's just wrong. Everything you knew before is still right. Yeah. End of the month, end of this month, Which end of February, crazy. within like the next two to three and, weeks. And the fact that they're still talking like this makes me think it's really going to happen. Happening. Well, yeah. they've already gotten their, their, their initial shipments. It's working. The $25 and $35 shipments are going to be happening. What you're going to be able to get at the end of February is the ones without the cases, where you just get the board, which is what I want anyway, because I want to shove that in a Game Boy or something. Mm-hmm. They're talking to uh, the uh, so that's the consumer release at the end of February, and then and then there's going to be another release yeah. later on with a case. Like, and I guess that's more targeted towards educational markets. It's yeah. going to come with an educational software stack on it. Right. Uh, I don't know what that means exactly, but it sounds interesting. But we can get that software stack. I mean, this the, you can already get. There's a there's a you can check everything out from the repos right now and get all the software you want. So it's just gonna be pre bundled then. It's just gonna be pre bundled. Uh, and that, that we do, we we're the nerds. We want it without the yeah, case. We can oh, just yeah, slap this yeah, in oh, something anyway. Or, honestly. Just leave it outside of the case and stick it on the top of my desk and plug it in my monitor. Exactly. That's kind of how I want to run it. Uh, so the Model A will cost $25. The Model B will cost $35. The only difference really is Ethernet. Yeah, there you go. There and you go. And it's coming. No plans for pre-order, which kind of sucks because I'd love to pre-order one. God, you know what's going to suck is if they announce it and I'm asleep and I wake up and they're sold out. Yeah. I'm going to freak. Yeah. And I'm going to hope to God some Linux Action Show listeners bought one for me. I know, right? Yeah. All uh, right, continue. So, um, Brian, I'm yeah. a conflicted man. I'm a troubled man, Brian. Okay. I have problems with mate. I've got problems with you Gnome do have 3. some mating. I've got problems, problems with Unity. You I've got do. problems with XFCE. I've got problems with Awesome. I've got problems with X Nomad, Brian. I've got problems. You mean X Monad? Yeah. Uh, so I think I'm switching to KDE. Really? Yeah, I think I'm going to switch to KDE. And here's one of the things: is stupid. See, you've all we've done we've done the KDE thing before, and you've always left after know, a week and gone back to Gnome or but something. Here's what here's one of these things: is recently the uh, canonical guys. And gals have been working on uh, on stepping up Unity, right? And they're okay. they're gonna add that new HUD killer or that new HUD that kills the menus, right? Yeah. All the pie in the sky concept stuff, right? Right. Well, some boys over at KDE at the KDE project were like, "Boom! Meet KDE's new HUD. We bang this thing together in a few days." Using K Runner. Using K Runner. Which already exists and has been in use for a while. But here's K-Runner's the thing. great. All of these things, all what I've realized is what the KDE guys have really done here is they've built this entire infrastructure of awesome, and that all this stuff is all available because all this other stuff can communicate with each other, is is aware of what each other apps are doing. There's this really well integrated, streamlined approach that the whole KDE desktop has. Now I don't like its defaults necessarily, but I think if I can tweak it, I might do it. And yeah, this, if you tweak it enough, it's rock and roller coaster. This story about how these guys just created this HUD for KDE. It took like no time. I, I just like that to me seems like a platform that has a lot of potential. QT also seems like a long term player. You got Nokia that throws in behind it. You got a lot of big industry heavyweights that are behind QT. Yeah. Uh, I'm just QT saying. is great. It's a great framework. Gnome, KDE is a great desktop. Gnome three and Unity and all those they're they're diluting 
I think, GTK in a sense. Like, GTK used to be a thing. There was a version of GTK. <laughs> yeah, that it's you, still a thing. But but now you got you got like you got Mate, you got Cinnamon. Yeah, but those are those are those are versions of the gnome shell. I know those aren't I know, GTK. But, but they use GTK, right? Yeah, they do use. And GTK. do they use and really, upstream GTK or is it a fork of GTK that now they have specific versions of in their repo? on the edition. I don't yeah. like it. I don't like it. <sighs> I think it's messy, and I don't like it. If if it helps any, I don't like it either. All right. Okay, well, then I guess we covered that. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, I, I hear exactly what you're saying. I've kind of gone the opposite route as you. Like, like th this KD HUD, uh, you should check out the uh, the show notes and check the video out of yeah. it. Because honestly, what's impressive to me is, yeah, they slapped this together using KRunner and basically provided the functionality that they're going to be providing in the HUD in the next version, or the version you, after you the know. next version of Unity and Ubuntu. Remember. And it's right there, and this is just a quick slap together version. Who knows where they could go from here if they deemed it really valuable. Now my question That's impressive. is, you know, I, and I think if I'm going to go KDE, I want to go 4.8. I just got to go. I got to get in there. Well, I don't, 4.8's a great release. I don't want to be left behind, so yeah. uh, that's that's my thing. KDE 4.8 is great. That's what I'll be doing this week. You know what's crazy? Give it another go. We're at KDE 4.8. Mm -hmm. 4.8. Mm -hmm. That means we only got like one more release before really it's KDE 5 time. Uh, just in time for it to get screwed Cause, up. Because I hope to God they don't go <laughs> get KDE 4.10. I want to see them just go KDE 5, oh, no. mothers! I kind of like the sound of 4.10. 4.10? Nah, it sounds... And ugh. then, well, you know what? Okay, all right. You What about 4.11? Right, so you mean you have to get through four ten, but then you get four. Then you get the four one one. Yeah, that's kind of cool. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah okay. I'm all right, right Brian. The next story on the news docket for this week. Okay. All of you people out there still rocking the original open Linux phone, the Open oh, Moco. Oh God! You can now actually get an upgrade for it, which is actually kind of cool. Is this really any decent? Yeah, well, kind of. So, so okay. So the Neo Free Runner, the original Open Moco phone. Yeah. Uh, which we talked about back like, the first year. Of we, the Linux we Action Show. We played with the 1973. We had, yeah. A, yeah, we had a little phone. I mean, it was at the time that, that that phone came out, it was slightly underpowered, had a fairly small screen, um, and didn't really have any software available for it. And then the software got a little bit better, and then it seemed like it just disappeared. Yeah. Well, it hasn't disappeared. There's still a company behind it, OpenMoco, and they're still making stuff. They've released a brand new board for it. That's awesome. It uses the same screen. But basically, you crack open your old Neo Freerunner case and you slap in a board that's the same size, and you get like an 800 megahertz chip. Yeah, you get a little more RAM, you get a little better storage. You get a faster, uh, you get a faster UTMS. Uh, yep. Remember, this thing only had Edge. The original, uh, yeah. So now only you had get 3G Edge. finally. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's so you get a better phone. Basically, this upgrades you to like a middle of the road Android phone. Now, the cool part about this is, is you can actually run Android on this board just oh. fine. In fact, there's a version of Android you can download for it and slap it on there because it's a completely open phone. You can throw whatever you want on there. There's no firmware lockdown or anything like that. What a concept! Which is nice. Um, it's kind of a small screen, but it's fairly high res. I think it's like 400 by 600 or something like that. I was just like trying that. to dig through the stats because I honestly don't remember. Um, fairly high res, but fairly small in size. But uh, it's not too bad. But the cool part is, is you, there is a decent Linux distribution available for this, mm. so you can get whatever software you want on it. It's it's pretty cool. Yeah, the, the board problem itself is, is open source. They're not really selling massively a bunch of new phones well, yeah. you can get with this board. Right. If you want this board, you really need to get your hands on an old Neo Freerunner case, crack it open, and swap it out. I like this. Which so, is kind of cool. I kind of wish other phone makers would do something like this. It says here the designs, uh, the designs, the documentation, and the circuit diagrams are licensed under open source licenses, and anyone can carry out further development and work on them. The CAD files yep. uh, uh, also do, do are available in a 3D printing format, meaning the users can print themselves and have it, or have it printed yes. by a third-party provider. So if you have one of those cool 3D printers, which I... Really wouldn't mind if someone bought for us, or just let us play with one, or for just, an or just send us one for like yeah, a week. Yeah. Uh, you can print out your own case, right. which is super neat. We promise not to make sex toys with it. All right, Brian. The next story on the news docket. Remember the Ed Nine, Brian? I do remember the Ed Nine. Well, it's not dead yet, Brian. It's not dead it's yet. It's not dead yet. Just a flesh wound. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I think we made that joke last week because it's think, the same crap. But uh, I think we did. All right, Brian. There's a few Nokia N9 owners around, probably like one or two, 
Uh, so this must be exciting to them, right? Now, well, here here was my thoughts on this. There's a brand new update coming out for the Mego based N9. Mego based N9. Now, we've Brian. been talking about this for a little bit. You know, we've we made our I made my prediction that this year Nokia would screw up their Windows Phone seven eight whatever shenanigans, and right. they'd come up with a whole new OS, and they uh, deeply would regret having a, basically abandoned their their Mego based platform. Well, they've got a new update to the Mego OS that runs on the N9. Which is like their best selling phone. Man, this looks much. like WebOS in a and lot of it, ways. And it looks great. I mean, the deep, wonderful integration with Dropbox. Yeah, uh, I like Right that. into the OS. Tons and tons and tons of great features in here. It makes the phone look stellar. I mean, it was already a good looking phone. Now it looks even better. And what, what kind of causes me a little bit of pause here is. Why on God's green earth is Nokia doing this unless they know full well that they need to hedge their bets? Remember, that's what I said. As I said, they might ride this Microsoft train as long as they can get Microsoft to invest money in them. Because if you look at the numbers, Nokia yep. could whittle down, whittle down, whittle down, maintain some decent hardware sales, and they make profits just from Microsoft paying them for being a Windows platform supporter. Right. It kind of makes sense in yeah, a way. It could. It's you horrible, never know. and yeah. it makes me angry. Yeah. yeah. But uh, if that's if that's not the plan, then they definitely need to get you in there as the CEO. Because if, if that's, that's, not what, plan, if that's, that's what I'm saying, that's what I'm saying. If that's not the plan, that needs to be their plan. We're gonna be laughing. How at them. easy is that plan? Super easy. Super right? easy. Yeah. But this seriously looks fantastic, and I, I I love this because it gives you a nice, it gives you a good package repository, a good open source platform on mm -hmm. your phone. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is the successor to the N900, which is still my favorite phone. You mean like it's we could glorious. live in a future where I could have a phone and a, and I could get a different phone and I could install my own operating system, move my own data over, and own it, and have all of my own apps that I have on each device? Shenanigans. <laughs> What, Ryan? Crazy. All right, the next story on the news docket is going to get a little heavy, but we'll keep moving right through it. So remember, we've been talking about this Barnes & Noble and Microsoft patent situation where uh, the early reports were that maybe the Barnes & Noble Microsoft thing had gone for turn for the worse in favor of Microsoft. Now, those, like we pointed out on the show, were just based off of a really ambiguous title of, of this judge's filings. I, yeah. Turns out the situation wasn't quite as dire as it is, but it's still not great. So, so it started with like Microsoft had this whole bunch of patents. Like it might have been a whole bunch. Might have been like in the in the hundreds, a quadrillion. It got whittled down to five patents that that they say Barnes and Noble is violating. Now it's been whittled down to three patents. Oh gosh! Now the problem is these remaining three patents. Basically, although I'll read you some of their comments because they're awesome. Basically, Barnes and Noble's defense is these patents are ridiculous. And the problem is, is that often isn't what the judge decides on, right? The judge will often say, well, I'm sorry, they're, they're, they're legal. I mean, they've got those patents. They might be ridiculous, but they've got them. But we'll see, because they are pretty ridiculous. They're super ridiculous. So ours has a big write-up on it, but I'll jump you right down to the meat here. Uh, it's great, because they cover, they have some diagrams and stuff from the patent filings. But uh, okay. Ours Ryan, had a great write-up on this, by the way. Patent number 6891,551. Highlighting and selecting elements of electronic documents. Seriously? <clears throat> Highlighting text in a document. Microsoft filed this in Ironically, 2001. Ironically, for those watching the video version, <laughs> the you will see <laughs> us having text highlighted in an electronic document. Patent violator. <laughs> and Google documents, patent violator. Uh, all right. So it, Michael, Microsoft filed this in 2001. It says it covers a computer system and method for highlighting and selecting elements of electronic documents. God damn it. <laughs> I know, right? I know. Uh, okay. So Barnes and Noble states, uh, and, and I love this, and it goes on for a while and it just gets more ridiculous, but Barnes and Noble's sure response to this is, and this is a quote, the simple act of using handles for their very purpose Changing the size of selections was neither novel nor non-obvious at the time this patent was issued. Further, Barnes & Noble denies that the Nook device even includes handles with the functionality in in described in the patent itself. It doesn't. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? That's, that's actually a problem with the Nook. <laughs> I know. It's just, that's just that's an awesome response, though, because like Microsoft has this very bureaucratic, very heady like Honestly, legalese response and Barnes Noble's like hit you in the face. Well, here's the thing. Barnes and Noble Nook doesn't have really great functionality in that <laughs> regard. This would be like Microsoft I know, going I know. after Apple because Apple had really great multitasking in the first iPhone. Or or something just yeah. like they they don't have that. <laughs> All right. You crazies. I got two more we got to go through cuz they're just awesome. Uh patent number 5, comma 778, comma 372. <laughs> Quickly downloading documents <laughs> from a browser. <laughs> 
<laughs> <He's right. laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> oh, ow. Here's the here's here's Chris. the quote from Microsoft. The browser also prioritizes oh. downloading of embedded images of the document by their incorporation in the currently visible portion of the electronic document. Further, the browser dynamically creates additional connections for retrieving resources incorporated <laughs> in the electronic document from the remote computer network. Oh, okay, that makes sense. Microsoft specifically notes that the Nook has a pre-installed web browser, Brian. Oh! Pre-installed web browser. Son of a! Which draws initial- That was their idea! Can you believe that? Oh. Which, which draws initial web- which, dis which displays text before it draws the initial background. Okay, and that's no good. That's Microsoft that's got no that good. patented. Yeah, well, obviously. Here's what Barnes and Noble response is, and I love this. Uh, the <laughs> patent refers to the perception of slow displays invoking a background images images that existed typically with internet connections and processors at the text uh, at the time of filing, i.e., 1996. The patent describes displaying text and redisplaying text again after the background image loads. While this uh, duplicate display may have had some use in the 1990s, it has no value in connectivity and processors of today used by the Nook and the Nook Color devices. As in, just STFU, devices have gotten better, you're out of date, you old dinosaur. I love it. <laughs> Alright, here's, here's the last one already. No, that was the last one already, because the other ones are, the other ones, well, they're just very long and, and wordy. But long I, and wordy. But dude! Go read this. I mean, honestly, I, I had a hard time sitting in my chair while reading this. Well, and doesn't it prove it was hilarious? Doesn't it prove too that Microsoft is cherry picking who they go after with these? All right, hold violations? on. I need to make this clear. All right, because the chat room, uh, guys, people listening, we are not making this up. <laughs> Barnes and Noble did not make this up. No, this is actually real. Yeah. Microsoft is really has these patented. And is really going after Barnes and & Noble for them. I think what's them. so super telling about this case is how it started out with all of these patents, and as the case has progressed, it's whittled down and whittled down, and now what it's standing on are these ridiculous patents. And think about the money Microsoft is making from Android and Linux developers because of these weak patents. And Barnes really & Noble weak. is the only people fighting them in it because it's Microsoft. I mean, here's the thing. You know, I get really on the fence about things like, let's say like the fat file system, yeah, right? Yeah. Like, okay. If Microsoft made that, somebody had to and they have it, it yeah. patented. You know what? I kind of feel like maybe that shouldn't be patented as a mm. file system. I feel like I, I'm kind of I'm torn there. I hear but you. Technically, that's a unique thing that they made. Uh huh. It's an it's an but innovation. As basic old as it is. concepts like high like using a highlighter. Yeah. Or or something like that. I'm like, how can you? Or what do you? I know. Are you? What? You, and, what? And the thing is, is when Microsoft filed these patents, it's so obvious prior art exists for that stuff. Seriously, so much. Like a highlighter. <laughs> I know. Like, or, seriously. I know. It's so bad. It's so bad. All right. Ah! Well, let's bring it down, because yeah. we got the next news docket story. And it's funny. I'm all uh, here. I am talking about how I am all raw, raw, raw KDE, right? Yeah. Well, Canonical came out and took a bit of a poop on the. Yeah, not uh, so much. Yeah. Canonical's not so big on the KDE. The Kubuntu status has been switched from an official distro supported by Canonical to now one that'll be maintained by the community. Kind of like the community uh, respin. Zubuntu. Or Lubuntu. Or, or all the other ones. Yeah. Um, or Ubuntu. Yeah. It's kind of a bummer. You know, it turns out, too, you kind of get oh. an interesting perspective of how Kubuntu was operated at Canonical and, and how like, right. it was really just a dude. Well, it's it, here it is. Just this dude. really isn't that big a news overall. There was one guy on Canonical's payroll who was in charge of maintaining and running Kubuntu. That's all there was to it. He was keeping that going. And he's been doing it for years now. Now, there really hasn't a good business case for Canonical doing that. Yeah. I mean, there's they don't get a lot of money for that. In They've fact, got their own distro. Uh, Kubuntu really just kind of distracts people away from using Unity and everything there else. There is that an arc. Makes. So we have uh, LinuxActionShow.reddit.com, which yeah. is an awesome subreddit for Linux news. Thank you yeah. everybody who submits. We also need more people voting. We've got a ton of people submitting, but not a lot of people voting. Uh, but one of the things that came out from the awesome community is an interview with some people from Canonical, and uh, what they reveal is in seven years, they never had a single support contract, a business support contract for Kubuntu. Right. Um, despite Which like they having, offered, but no one yeah, took them up on it. Despite having huge deployments. Big deployments. You know, it, it's, it's, it's... Really you, big. You, when you look at those kind of numbers, you kind of do have to understand where they're coming from. And actually, you know, some of the deployments are talked about in the link that we provide there. There's like, a, you know, when the, with the guy stepping down, he puts up a little post that says, you know, hey, we got this deployment here with this 80 bazillion installs and whatnot. I recommend checking it out because it does give some interesting insight into who's using Kubuntu, but... But yeah, no one's no one's taking up Canonical on their offer of of paid technical support for right. Kubuntu. So it doesn't matter. So I kind of get why why Kubuntu or Canonical is dropping 
paid support of Kubuntu. On and the other hand, it's kind of a bummer still. Zubuntu's been strong though, <coughs> and I and I th I think almost the, it could have a better chance to flourish under community management. I don't. I, some of the things in that interview, I really recommend you guys go to the Linux Action Show subreddit and find this interview. Because uh, one of the other things I don't like in there is uh, the the guy says, "Well, we'll be you know we won't be officially supporting uh, Kubuntu with our work hours." But uh, I'm, I'm sure that, uh, what's the guy's name here? Um, Jonathan. Jonathan can do it after hours. He'll work on it Jonathan after hours Riddell. in his spare time, like many open source projects. All right, but here's the BS thing about that. Yeah, that he says, uh, he says uh, He says in here that uh, he, he doesn't have a lot of time because he has health issues and that he doesn't have time to work on it after hours. Yeah. So these canonical guys... He has, to, he has to have some way to make money and get health insurance, guys. So if he's doing a different job, he's not working on this. I just, it just really, not much. It really bugs me that the canonical guys in an interview were kind of putting him on the line saying, we will work well, on it after hours. If it, if it hours. fails, it's his fault because he's not doing it. Yeah, I mean, he's not, put, he's right. not working on it after hours like most that, open source projects. That and he's got health issues? did kind of bug me. Yeah. Um, I'm okay with canonical saying, you know what, this is a financial loss for us. We're right. just not going to do it anymore. Right. That's okay. Didn't really care for the attitude so much. Business is business. Yeah, yeah. 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 It was a little, uh, a, little a little too, funky, right? a little too business is business. It yeah. could have been like, hey, we know there's a big community. This is really important to you guys, but you know we have to so, make this decision. Yeah, and they just need to leave it at that. And honestly, I think everyone would have understood. All right, B-Man. Now, uh, before we get to our last news story for the day, yeah. You got something cool you're working on, it's, and it's going to be a, a yeah. game for Linux. Let's talk about it. Yeah, I'm making a game. Tell or us I about made this. a game, and yeah. it's coming out on Valentine's Day, uh, which is uh, February 14th. For those of you who do not know what Valentine's Day is and uh, are in trouble now. Uh, that's, the, that's the time of the year my wife gets really mad at me. Yes, every year. Mm -hmm. Every single year. Right. All right, so that's Tuesday. On Tuesday, I'm releasing a new adventure game for Linux and some other platforms that people have heard of i haven't heard of any other platforms i haven't heard of any other do you do another podcast i don't do any other platform podcast so i don't i don't think so no no so it's just for linux then essentially all right no, so what do we not. got here? it's for anything anyway it's an adventure game uh set in the 2299 universe which is my web comic uh for 2299.2299online.com and it's a really old school 8-bit inspired very retro adventure game think uh space quest or leisure suit larry or uh king's quest or uh Day cool. of the Tentacle, Maniac Mansion, all those various games uh, with 8-bit style graphics and uh, entirely set in space. That's it. That's it in a nutshell. It is a fully adventure game. Everything kind of has a done on an old green typed out terminal. When text displays, it gets, you know, printed out like an old terminal. <laughs> yep. Awesome. I mean, it's pretty fast. so You don't have to sit around and wait for it, yeah, but yeah. it has that kind of look. You know, like, I like that, man. Terminal old school hacker looking thing. Uh, anyway, it's a it's a it's so, kind of like my love letter to adventure to game. the genre. Yeah. Yeah. I nice. love adventure games. And I've always wanted to make my own adventure game. And now that I've got this web comic with this kind of with this cool cast of characters, I decided to pull it all together and build a big, giant, old space opera comedy sort of tongue-in-cheek sci-fi adventure nice. game out so, of it. Uh, so on Valentine's Day, people go over to 2299online.com. Yep, and they buy it. It's five bucks. No DRM of any kind. You don't get a key. You just download the game if you pay for it. That's awesome. Um, now, which a lot of people would be like saying, well, how do you keep it from people pirating it? Well, because I'm hoping people are good people. And I'm providing it so easily that why would you pirate it? Right. Five bucks. You get it for whatever platform you want. And I'm going to publish the statistics on who's buying it for what platform. So it's available for Linux, Windows, and Mac. And it's all for the same price. And it works the same on every one of them. All platforms, I'm going to let people know Nice. Look forward uh, what to that. the sales are like uh, across all of them. Valentine's Day is going to be special this year, Brian. That's right. <laughs> all right. Well, well, what I'm trying to do, you wake up in the morning. Yeah. You say, it's Valentine's Day. You go buy yourself an adventure game, mm -hmm. and you spend all day playing that. Yeah. And then, love. Right. Love right. comes from that. Love comes from that. All right, B-Man, well, let's talk about the last story on the news docket for this week. It is a distro we once shy the Linux action show Love Light on. And that is Sabayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayay
which is mega fast. Very cool, though. Things are in the portage tree fast. Yeah. So yeah. check that out. Uh, we've we've talked about it before. After we've done a lot of, we did some arch talk lately. People are like, "How come you guys aren't talking about Gen two? And I'm like, "Well, well we here want you go. To. This is something to look at. Tangentially, us talking about Gen two. If you want to dip your toes in the Gen two <laughs> pool, go check out Sabian <laughs> Linux eight and check out Cinnamon too, and see what you think. Which is great if you want to run Cinnamon. There you have it. All right, B man. That's all the news for this week. That's right. We recently saw a little bit of news come out of uh, a particular blog oh. that there is a new tablet coming that was specifically running KDE. <laughs> just, Did I just change the shot just to me? That's that's pretty good I trick just, there, I just, I just slapped my head down on the desk and it just zoomed in on me. That's fantastic. Now, we've obviously got a lot of questions about this. We, we have a ton of questions about yeah. this. So we thought yeah. we'd bring in the man with the plan, the man who was kind of unveiling all of this himself. Aaron Saigo, say hello to the entire world, Aaron Saigo. Hello, entire world. Aaron All right, Saigo. so We're hey, Aaron, welcome back. Oh, yes. Uh, so, so Aaron Saigo from the from the KDE project, um, who you all know and love uh, from what was uh, what was your blog's domain name? Saigo.com. A Saigo.blogspot.com. Never yeah. heard of it. Never, never heard of it. No, I, I don't think I don't think that was it. <laughs> I was something else. Yeah. Uh, okay. It was something. something well, else. but so uh, well, for those who haven't seen the news yet, what is the basic? idea of this particular tablet like what, what are, what's the high level here like when's it going to be available what's it what's it running and why is it cool sure so uh from a user's point of view what's really cool is right now you basically have two choices if you want to get a tablet right you have uh apple's devices with ios you have google android um both of those kind of treat you or you get a what we think of as an application bucket you buy a tablet you throw apps on it that's what you do um, and it's not really much more than that. So this tablet is coming with the Plasma Active uh, user interface, user experience. Um, you can actually see it if you go to plasma-active.org. There's a website dedicated to it. And while you can launch apps and get apps on it, um, it's actually centered around the concept of activities, which we started on Plasma Desktop, but I think has really started to shine on the, on the tablet. And are these um, activities, I mean, essentially we're talking about like plasma widgets here, like living kind of in predefined workspaces is kind of a thing? No. Uh, so the idea is I that like being wrong, by the way. <laughs> yeah, good yeah, job, right? Yeah. You nailed it. <laughs> yeah. Good <laughs> thing you're on another continent right now, Psygo. <laughs> <laughs> no, just kidding. All right. So, so, so how, yeah. what are activities? Okay. So the, the easiest way to explain is kind of through the use case, right? Um, we have a laptop or a tablet, and we tend to take it with us wherever we go. At least I do mine. Well, not everywhere, but close yeah. enough. Yeah. Um, and when I'm doing work things, I'm, I have a few projects at work. But when I'm outside of work, I'm with friends, I'm doing other things. Um, I use the same machine for all of these different things in life, whether it's a work project, um, a vacation I'm taking, or just hanging out with friends. Totally. So what, what activities let you do is it lets you set up a context for each one of those things you're doing. So if you have two or three projects at work, you might set up one activity per, uh, per project. If you're um, in university or school of some sort, you might set up one activity per subject. Um, you might set one up again for you know, friend things, hobbies, etc. And then what you can do is you can switch into that activity and, and then the device becomes completely dedicated and oriented towards that activity. Mm. And then what you can do is you can associate uh, things that are related to it. People, websites, documents, applications and widgets as well. But it allows you to aggregate all the things that, according to you, um, have something to do with that activity. And this is really cool for tablets because, you know, they have, I saw you both have seven inch tablets. Yep. I really love the form factor. Yeah. yeah. Really, yeah. you throw it in a pocket, away you go. It's excellent for that. It fits in the coat pocket. No problem. Totally. Exactly. The only issue with this smaller size screen, even the 10 inch uh, tablets uh, have kind of this, this issue. Um, you can't really cram everything you do onto the screen at once. Mm -hmm. And so activities allow you to take the device and orient it towards what you're doing right now. Um, and what Plasma Active does is makes it extremely simple and fast to switch between activities, um, add things to them. Uh, it even watches what you're doing while you're doing it on the device. It doesn't phone home or anything and can actually start to make recommendations. Uh, Wait, it doesn't phone home? I'm out. Uh, you, don't you need my out. Don't you need my personal information yeah, and all seriously. of my usage statistics? When I type I mean, text, you send it uh, up to the cloud, and yeah. then you send it back if I'm allowed actually, to actually have typed it. Could you guys build an, uh, an address book upload? Because I hear I have to get seriously, path if I, I love want that. that. I and love I would just like to send everybody my address book. So no, this is this is kind of <laughs> cool. So let me let me see if I got yeah. this straight. So activities are kind of like if you had 
a virtual desktop, but more than that, also associated information and files with that exactly. virtual desktop. So I could have a virtual desktop that had particular files that were, say, for, for, for my coding project and another one now, for my games, uh, these are just These are just uh, UI differentiators. There's not, like, security containers. Like, you know, one of the things that uh, some of the Android software vendors are trying to do is, like, virtualization for Android. That way you can have a work environment and you can yeah. have a play environment. This is more organizational, right? Interesting you should ask that, actually, because we're right now uh, working. It's not in the current release. It will hopefully be in the release we're doing this summer, at least it's set to be. Uh, where you can uh, take any given activity or set of activities and lock them down. So oh, you can ask for cool. them if you want, um, but as long as they're not running, they're actually encrypted uh, on disk and cannot be accessed. Oh, that's slick. Yeah. Now, now, if you have an encrypted non-running activity, can you back it up like sort of a deal? Exactly. Like, oh, that's cool. Absolutely. That's cool. That's nice. Could, um, oh, man. I'm Encrypt just, it, not running off disk, back it up to your Dropbox. I think so so that's, what, that's what it is for users, right? I mean, for users, we're trying to give a uh, what I personally think of as a post-consumer user interface um, or post-consumerist. We're not treating the user as just a consumer of apps, but as someone who actually wants to take a device and you know, live Make it with. their own. Yeah. So that's really what we're trying to accomplish for the people who will be using it. Huh. For people like you and me, who are a little more maybe technically, you know, the technology lit plays a slightly bigger role in our life. What's really cool about this tablet is it comes with a completely normal uh, Linux stack. So you can take virtually any software that builds on Linux and build it and run it on this tablet. You don't have the yes. kind of strange, weird runtime user space that you find on uh, Android. So you get good this. native Linux apps. I love this. Exactly. What's even more uh, exciting for, for me as a free software guy, because I also have that whole free software ethos um, mm -hmm. that drives a lot of what I do personally, uh, we're working to make the entire software stack free software. Um, one of the really exciting things that was announced recently at FOSDEM is uh, work on a free software implementation of a driver for the Mali 400 GPU, which is nice. actually GPU, uh, that we use inside the tablet. Nice. Um, reverse engineered, on, you know, which we're hoping we'll get, uh, we'll, you know, eventually see the vendor get involved. Um, so this is really cool that, you know, we're not the only one working towards kind of this free software, uh, you know, full suite free software on devices stack. We think it's really important because we re rely more and more on these devices. And if we don't have the ability to run them on our terms, uh, we've kind of lost something in, in terms of, you know, the the aim for free software. Yeah. Now, <clears throat> uh, just to kind of look at the the hardware for a second, because honestly, from a software standpoint, I mean, so it's it's based on Mare, which is you know a nice Linux distribution, mm -hmm. which kind of sort of right. had its roots in the in the Mamo community and then the Migo side of things, and and it's kind it's of being yeah, it's the community continuation of Migo. Exactly. Um, and so uh, so that that's very very cool. I have I, I like that. I like that that's that project's going somewhere, and I like that that project's actually being used on a tablet. There yeah, have been a lot that. of these forks that have. Have, have almost occur occurred that have just never quite found their way to a piece of hardware like Cordia and mm -hmm. a bunch of other projects that I'm just like, yeah. well, it doesn't matter if they exist because it's not going on anything. This one's actually shipping yeah. on something. Yeah. And that's just awesome. That's a great point. Um, so <clears throat> let's look at the hardware side of things for a second. I mean, yeah. people it, really, so this is a piece of hardware that's pretty... I don't want to just call it average because, I mean, because it's running a bunch of open source software and running KDE and Mare, that makes it above average from our standpoint. But from a, from a pure hardware standpoint, it's not like it's a quad from core a CPU. Specs. From the tech spec standpoint, it's a pretty average run-of-the-mill 7-inch what you'd get on an Android tablet. But uh, so at first I was a little bummed out about that. I was like, well, you know, I would like to see something a little more beefy than that because I want to get a new tablet and I want something real beefy. I would but disagree. Then I, but then I saw some videos. And it's running really smoothly. Well, and the other thing to factor in is like Android has to deal with all of that exactly. emulated environment, so it takes that's a lot of you got to figure. It's a that's huge a, overhead. Yeah, so yeah, you need a lot more need horsepower. Yeah. Um, now, what I was amazed at, and and this is just to uh, make a long story short, is KDE has KDE has how do I put this? It has a stigma attached to it where it's not necessarily as peppy as some of the other desktop environments. Oh. It looks great. It Whoa. has a lot of cool effects. Hey, I'm a KDE guy now, Brian. The gloves are coming off. Great, great, great. Uh, <laughs> and it's awesome. And everyone looks at KDE and is like, wow, this does so much. But it may it may be a little a little bit slower. Like a lot of improvement has happened lately. Like in KDE 4.8, the file browser is just like mega crazy faster. And a lot of a lot of great stuff's happening there. But what I was impressed with was despite that kind of a little slower stigma, 
plasma active just kind of looks like it's flying on this it, tablet. On the videos, it does, yeah. Now, is there is that really what the performance we can kind of expect to see from the shipping tablet when it comes out in March? I mean, it, or is that doctor? Is that bit? demo hardware? Yeah, is that hardware? demo hardware? <laughs> yeah. No, actually, what's kind of fun, no, that's actually the real device that it's really going to be shipping on. And what's funny is um, on the OS image that it's running, it's actually not running at full uh, GPU acceleration. <laughs> I love that. So awesome. that's the that's at least that's slowed down. The interface is going to run. Um, so and this is yeah. I mean, we uh, KD software. I, I know the stigma you're talking about very well. Um, and at times, it's been very well earned. Uh, the desktop is, is a complicated space, and it can be difficult to deliver things uh, to, especially desktops that just have such a variety of hardware. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, we've we've had a lot of you know issues with uh, even specific GPUs, right? Where specific uh, vendors with their desktop GPUs just you know, <laughs> specific they, unnamed they vendors, yeah, yeah, unnamed vendors, yeah, um, you know, just don't run well, and then we go, ah, okay. So we've done a lot of work on on. Um, Things like how do we deal with PixMap caching in the compositing window manager? Really boring stuff like that. That so has helped on desktop. Um, on devices, it's actually a little bit simpler because we have a specific GPU to target. We have you know a OpenGLES implementation, um, and we don't have to support every single possible desktop application uh -huh. um, out that there. Makes sense. So it removes a lot of the variables. Yeah. Um, we're also using the uh, Qt QML. Uh, frameworks for virtually the entire UI, the nice. primary UI anyways, not all the applications, of course. Um, and this has been designed, I mean, you guys were talking about the N9, I believe, in the uh, news section that yeah. I was watching earlier. Um, they use uh, the same kind of technology there. Yeah, and so, Q QML for those uh, who are un 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 familiar? inundated with with yeah. QML, it's basically a nice little markup language that's kind of geared towards making very visually rich, lots of animation heavy nice little applications. And it does a really nice job of it. Hmm. And it runs it interpreted, so you don't have to ah. uh, recompile. So what's really cool is that this is an ARM-based device, right? One gigahertz ARM processor. Um, you can take the same QML application and drop it on, say, an XOPC WeTab Intel chip-based tablet. You don't recompile, you don't do anything. That's sweet. Um, Isn't it, though? It's very cool. Um, there's some videos online. If you search on YouTube for uh, QML live coding, I think, um, in fact, there's some stuff with Raspberry Pi that you mentioned earlier. Yeah, um, cool. Very cool open hardware project um, showing live coding with QML and, and OpenGLIS. And even though it's not the most powerful device in the world, it's remarkable what you can accomplish with it. Yeah, it so, really cranks through. And and honestly, the, it, from pure tech spec standpoint, this tablet crushes the Raspberry Pi. So this is this is pretty excellent. Yeah. Now, I have a couple of business questions. you mind if we jump to those? I'd like no, to. What's the who's the what's the organization the company behind the Spark tablet itself? Like when I buy it, who am, who am I giving my money to? To me, no. Um, nice. So, That'd be hey, awesome uh, if that was true. <laughs> <laughs> so there, there's actually a a group of of. Uh, it's a community corporate organization, number one. So we obviously have the Plasma Active community. That's the best description of anything ever. I love community corporates. <laughs> yeah, me too. Yeah. Um, it, it, it is. It's hard to explain. You should hear it when I have to explain it to uh, our Chinese supply chain people. They just no no cultural like it just falls right. into the cultural ravine right. and translate at all. So we have a um, a very small company uh, that is handling the hardware shipment, a lot of the logistics, um, and those sides of things. It's actually based in the U.S. Um, and this is owned Go by. Team. People it's actually owned by people in the Plasma Active community, which is cool. Oh, that's very cool. Mr. Mango's already had, Mr. Mango in our IRC chat room already has his credit card number in there. You guys have to set up like an affiliate program or something because we'll sell, we'll sell thousands of these Seriously. things for you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, that was actually one of the, the frustrating things is that the logistics company that we're working with here in Europe to, and they'll be handling the pre-orders, um, had a hiccup last week and it still hasn't been resolved. And I was hoping to have the pre-order registration up last week. Didn't happen. Yeah, um, it, yeah, it as, is soon, as soon as people can pre-order, let us know because I mean, yeah. I'm going to be pre-ordering one, mm -hmm. and I can guarantee you, I will probably too. a significant percentage of the people who yeah. just who are watching yeah. the show live right now are yeah. going to be pre-ordering one. This is really exciting. It's like yeah. the, it's the yeah. first real Linux tablet that we've got. It we can buy. Well, and this is what's so cool is that okay. So number one, the proceeds. Talking about business, um, yeah. the proceeds will be going back to. Uh, 
both ensure that we can do new devices. People have been asking in the IRC, maybe Spark 2 will have quad core, or can I get one with 3G? These are things that are actually on our hardware roadmap. So some of the proceeds will be going towards ensuring that we can offer these kinds of things in future. Some of the proceeds will be going to actually paying open source community members as well as companies that Love. are, we, we want to work with entrepreneurial companies as much as possible. That's to awesome. Kind of stimulate and grow a network of, of uh, people that are trying to, with an correct, in our mind anyways, correct open source ethos, build business around this kind of now, thing. Aaron, do you guys know yet if you'll be shipping these worldwide or will only be to certain limited regions at first? Or how's that working? Like we've got people in chat room asking about South America and all kinds of stuff. South America, I'm still looking into in terms of uh, there, there's most of the countries, especially Brazil, have pretty high um, duties uh, on getting. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh. yeah. Okay. You said duty. Sorry. Sorry. What were you talking about? Duty. Yeah. Du <laughs> duty. Duty. Oh. Sorry. Yeah. And that's yeah, my. All right. That's, Keep talking about the boring thing. Okay. Um, so <laughs> we also still, we are still looking into how to best service South America in specific. But yes, we will be shipping uh, to all across Europe, um, nor uh, North America, so Canada, US. Nice. Uh, we can ship to Australia, whatever. Um, we will be over time looking- By the way, uh, our Australian uh, fans will love that you lumped them in with whatever. <laughs> they, they will think that that's exactly. fantastic, yeah. Well, they're used to it. They? <laughs> they, they should be. Poor guys. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> dot, dot. Um, so, yeah, so, but what we want to really do is end up with uh, regional um, retail partners that will be able to represent and take the, the hardware into their area and region. Um, uh, logistically, we really set up for uh, two things. One, the ability to be very agile so that we can drop deliveries pretty much anywhere in the world with very short notice. Uh, about five weeks, maybe six, depending where in the world it needs to go. Um, from the time we know we need devices to right through That's production, um, building them and having them delivered. Oh, That's man. really not bad. So have you guys talked price at all? Uh, we have. So uh, in I'm just Europe... Him to say it. Yeah, I'm just giving yeah. to say it. You know, I've got to get the people who I don't know. I've got I, I to gotta play the no, it was it was a good lead-in. I, I know, I know. Yeah, yeah but yeah. okay, continue. <laughs> Shut so, up and take yeah. my money. So, sorry, go ahead. So what we're aiming for in Europe for retail is around 200 euro for the device. That's awesome. That's awesome. So... We're still working on what the exact number will be in the U.S. and so other like markets. So like seven or eight dollars U.S. dollars. Something no, like unfortunately, that. I don't think so, Brian. You know, is that not how it's I working right so. now? No. Not oh. yet. Um, so, and that's actually kind of the other interesting thing that we're doing as well. We're talking with a lot of uh, well, three school uh, systems have actually approached us: one in Norway, one in Poland, totally. one in Spain. Totally. Yeah. Um, and what's neat is we actually do have a an add-on delivery system, aka App Store, but it does more than apps. So by default, when you get it, you'll actually have access via the App Store to all, um, all currently, as of yesterday, 36,000 and some odd Gutenberg books. Um, you also have access to, nice. you know, things like wallpapers and not just apps. So uh, it's, like a, it's more like a content repository than... Exa mm. Yeah, exactly. Mm. Um, most people, I think, looking at it will go, oh, it's an App Store because that's what they, you know, the yes. lenses that we're used to. Yeah, um, that's what they've been trained. <laughs> right. So the client side will be released uh, GPL on day one. Uh, the JSON APIs will be released as well. Cool. Um, and we're committing to releasing the server side as well as soon as we know that the the actual implementation scales to... Um, wow. To the Nobody else is doing that. Dude. Nobody uh, else. Awesome. Yeah. So what's really cool for school systems is they would be able to self-host either with us yeah. or with someone else their own content repository so they'd be able to ship... Uh, specific content for their school system to their students to individual schools this is so um, cool the app store is built around much like xbox and we around points okay. rather than dollar values and one of the reasons is because we wanted it to be able to be abstracted if, if necessary so you buy points you spend them great in a school environment they might just hand out points to students or schools right yeah i can see that um of, of course a lot of the content will be at you know zero points because that's cool too mm -hmm. um we don't mind that so, no, no one does. So we've, we've, we've been talking with school systems. Um, we're also talking with companies. Uh, a medical imaging company approached us last week. Um, we've been talking for a while with the people behind uh, Collab, the groupware. Oh, speech. yeah, yeah. Yeah, Collabsys, great guys. Um, about So they can actually deliver a tablet with contact touch on it for enterprise clients. You don't happen nice. to have one there with you, do you? Uh, the actual tablet hardware? Yeah, 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 no. I wish I did. I have another batch coming this week. All the ones I actually had are 
percolated out to good. various good. developers and, and engineers. That's good. Yeah. No, so that's, whenever, that's where they should be. See, yep. me, I, w- I would have hung hold on to like two or three of them like a jerk, but you did yeah. the right thing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, let me let me ask okay. you this. So, uh, uh, what if what if you're one of the you know closed source developers? What if you make a, a random bird and cow flinging game for for Android and you want to bring it over to this tablet? Um, yeah. Is is there is there going to be a system in place for getting your applications into into that store? Absolutely. So anyone who signs up to the store um, can upload content as well, um, and then once it goes through a simple curation process, just to make sure people don't upload. Yeah. You know, things that will destroy people's machines or right. do other nasty things right. um, can be made available. And like any other app store, if it sells, you you know the developer gets the bulk of the proceed, and we keep a little bit to make sure the store continues to run. Okay. So while we would prefer, of course, people to write uh, open source and free software and offer it, even at a cost, I think that also makes sense um, to say you know this costs you know you know one buck or Th- this, five, this costs but, three points be- for the yeah. the cost of me porting it over. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, because um, obviously, I'm, because it's you know free and open source and whatnot. I'm sure it's possible just to mount the whole thing as a drive, copy over the files, and and yes, load up for open source software anyway. So it's you're you almost paying SSH for the convenience of using yeah. the app store type interface sort of thing. Right. Exactly. I mean, you can SSH into it if you want. That's awesome. So. Nice. Yes. I. I uh, do we have any more tablet related questions? Because I kind of have a. I kind of have a KDE. Ah, and, ask your KDE question. Uh, Aaron, is there any other tablet related well, wait, topics wait, you want to touch on? What so, what website should they should they yeah. be tracking yeah. for up to date information? Yeah. On this? Geez, yeah. So we uh, will be track my blog for now. Um, right now we're doing just the community side of it and it was kind of funny because I thought I would with all the changes happening in my life with uh, sponsorship and whatnot I thought ah you know I'm doing a lot of thinking and mentioned what I was working up to and it just went crazy viral across the net as as, you know picked up everywhere Um, so yeah it was great a little bit uh, faster than I expected Um, but follow my blog for more announcements um, plasma-active.org for development of the UI side of it yeah, so, yeah, and you guys um, got you guys got some good videos up on the Plasma Active. Really great too. videos. It so looks when, gorgeous. Thank you very much. So when it will be available, we're aiming for May um, shipments to people. Um, hopefully, we'll hit that. It looks like we're still on on schedule for this. Um, awesome. And yeah, I, when we we open up pre order, I have a feeling that the initial order may actually be taken up completely by pre order. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. So I do recommend that when it becomes available, pre order so that you actually get one i want to i will i will definitely pre-order it now uh, seriously though dude uh, and i don't mean to <laughs> use my position here but if you know the pre-order is coming man, no. like give me a couple of hours heads up so i can like wake up yeah. and get my damn pre-order that's a good idea anyways because well you know we'll talk about it on the show we'll sit here show it i want to yeah. i want to sit it and i want to play with it I, and, and i want all and the people actually, who didn't get i want to replace my seven galaxy tab i'm in the market for a tablet exactly so. the same I, I mean i've got my little htc flyer here and it is a nice tablet there's nothing wrong with it it's mm-hmm. a good seven inch mm-hmm. tablet but man would i kill for a good open piece of software on this that i really like yeah. i mean i've got yeah. my little n900 and what i feel like and, and the chat room is kind of reiterating this is this spark tablet is kind of like the N900 of the tablet world. You know, it's the developer friendly, the geek friendly, the Linux open source nerd friendly tablet hardware that we've been pining for for a while. I bought sure. I bought a Lenovo netbook that's like a convertible tablet sort of thing yep. with a swivel screen. The yeah, thing is yeah. heavy, yeah, well, it's yeah. hard to hold, but technically yeah. it's a tablet and I run Linux and it's touch screen yeah, on it. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and I know a lot of people who watch the show bought that piece of hardware thinking, well, it'll do as a piece of yeah. as a tablet yeah. until I get a real tablet. Yeah. And now yeah. we actually have a real stinking tablet. Yeah. And that's so cool. All yeah, right, so... I'll oh, go ahead, Aaron. I was going to say, and I think what's really cool is you're completely bang on about it being something great for people like us, you know, who are the open source and tech geeks. Um, but I also think the, the user interface is really great for the general consumer market. Oh. And that's really our long Yeah, that's the great part of it. I don't disagree at all. It looks really pretty. Yeah. And it looks really easy to use. And I see its value. And I, think, and I don't care about that at all. And I, think I just love the nerdiness of it, and I want the nerdiness of yeah. it. That's great for us. I, think I don't care like, if this thing's running X monad I want it. I, think I mean, the KDE is great. I think, the, I think the activities thing could be a big hit among consumers. Uh, Wait a minute. This is running Mare. Yeah. I could throw a different window manager on it, too, couldn't I? Yeah. You could put an entirely different OS on it. It's not yeah. locked. Yeah. It's awesome. It's awesome. It's awesome, right? All right, now I love you guys. People, people probably know, but people awesome. might not know that Aaron, you've had you know 
key involvements with the KDE project for forever now. And I was just wondering, it's not really your area, but one of the news stories we covered today is Canonical is dropping official support of Kubuntu. Do you have any yeah. take on that and any thoughts about that and what that could mean as far as KDE adoption and things like that? Well, I think it... it follows directly from Canonical's uh, game plan that's been unveiled over the last, you know, what, two years now, where they're going towards Unity. Um, yeah. So I don't think it was a huge surprise. Um, I think if you look at Kubuntu itself, uh, I don't think it's gonna really going to go anywhere in terms of, I don't think it's going to evaporate and die. Um, as you guys mentioned in that new segment, uh, there is only one guy who was paid to work on it. The rest of the team is volunteer community right. anyways. Right. Um, so, and I would also mention that Jonathan uh, Riddle, who's been an absolute hero over the last seven years, six years um, on Kubuntu, he actually wasn't involved in the last release of Kubuntu because at Canonical, they allow you to cycle to other teams um, every so often just to, you know, stay fresh. That's cool. And so he said, I want to go and work on BZR, Bizarre, the uh, distributed regression yeah. control system that Canonical uses. And so he went and worked on that team. Um, it's, seriously, and it took me like, a good two minutes to figure out what the heck you were talking about. I'm like, BZR. Oh, yeah. BZ, oh, bizarre. BZR. I'm like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, Z, yeah. Z. I'm like, what are you doing? I said it gets you, man. Man. <laughs> I said all words before I used them. <sighs> um, so, uh, anyways, so yeah, so he was actually involved really in the last release of Kubuntu during work hours, and it still came out and it was still fine. So it, was, I, it still was. I, yeah. I don't think it's, it's, it's uh, as big a deal for Kubuntu. It's obviously not great news for Kubuntu. Um, for KDE, there's a lot of uh, distros out there that ship terrific KDE support, anyways. Um, I think Kubuntu will continue on uh, as well. I think it really says more about um, Canonical's commitment to Unity as the interface. Yeah, I totally uh, agree. Yeah, Unity for them is the way forward. That's yes. that's they're they're the Unity company almost more than the Linux ecosystem company. I don't mean to take it away from them that they're not a Linux company. It's just, you know, this is their big play. This is their big play. Yeah. I mean they're they're building their T V thing they're, on top of Unity. Is, they're trying in Unity. to they're trying to make this their big differentiator. Right. Yeah. And that's fine. Yeah, I mean, Google's got Android. I think Canonical kind of sees this and goes, we need something too. And so now they're, Canonical has, has Unity. I think that's really the integrated approach they're going for. Yeah. So, But they're, com I, they're coming after the tablet space with it too, I think. So that's just something, I mean, you could, they could end up in a sense being a competitor to, you, to, the, to your project. Okay, so do you know how many tablets are sold? Oh, I know, I know. Yeah, you're right, you're right. Seven. Yeah, there's other, there's other big tablets out there that are already competitors. <laughs> yeah, so I, I think there's a huge amount of space for, for both of us. I wouldn't be too concerned. And I, my hope is that those of us who are actually working on open hardware um, and, and open OSs for things like tablets can actually work together on the places that we have commonality. Yes. Yeah, totally, totally. totally. I, honestly, yeah, Canonical getting more into the tablet space, I can only see is helping you guys. And really, for us, for us as the nerds, wouldn't it be awesome if you guys were in the same space yeah. as Canonical and a bunch of Canonical yeah. partners releasing Unity-based tablets? Theoretically, we've got Ubuntu and Mare sitting over here. We can kind of swap environments and user and, and user stacks and everything else. Yeah, and those are the great tablets that we're going to be using. Yeah, not the Android tablets, not the the iPads and the whatnot of the world. So I mean, really, the more tablets we have over here on our side of the fence, that are they really just compete with Android. And all now. the underlying stuff is that's all great. open source and gets shared. And if some user land stuff is private, well, that's how it is. But you know, the the core stuff, the architecture. Now let me stuff. ask you this: So have you already contacted Microsoft about paying them their fifty fifteen dollars <laughs> per tablet that you're you're making? Yeah, you better get that license agreement figured out there. <laughs> and they said, Aaron who? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And I said, yes, I'll owe you $15. Yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> no. So, no, we haven't. And I think that is a great mess um, uh, there. Uh, mm, with, it is, with, yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and we're not hearing all of what's going on, as you can imagine. Mm -hmm. uh, the fights that we don't hear about uh, are usually because they don't make it to court. Right, they just sign the agreements very quietly. Right, and it's, I can't say much about it because what I've been told has been told under, you know, of course. Yeah. But it's actually not the same patents that they are being successful with that they're going after, um, you know, the, well, the likes of, of Kindle and whatnot. Right. Um, they, they're, they're different because they're, one is a tablet and one they're, con like, they're constituting the Nook is more of like a desktop. And so therefore it's qualified to be, uh, you know, it's a different patents apply to it. Well, and different things right? have different sets of features, right? Yeah. Not everything, for instance, syncs to a desktop directly. Right. So there are different patents on different feature sets. Um, 
And yeah, and it's, it's also different companies, right? Uh, looking at, uh, yeah, what is the best way to go? And I think as well, you find a lot of the companies are in unfortunate conflicts of interest where they, you know, have fabrication houses uh, where, you know, Microsoft may want to be making devices. Right. And so you, they have additional business uh, relationships to think about. So it's right. a complicated mess. On the open source side, the free software side, uh, there are things that we can do. Um, and something that, I, that is starting to pick up steam um, that I just recently got on and I'm all buzzed about it is this thing called defensive publication. And what it is is where instead of applying for patents, you create a document very much like um, a patent uh, application, except it's much simpler so it doesn't take a lot of time. You have a diagram, a description, and then you uh, register it with one of the very few places that patent clerks look. And the idea is to prevent a twofold. Number one, to prevent bad patents being or patents at all right. being granted on innovations that we're doing in, in open source. Um, and secondly, it's to hopefully uh, create a, a alternative to, you know, you have to patent everything. Right. Um, you can also defensively publish things instead of patenting them. So some companies have been doing this for a few years now. Some big companies like Philips is apparently quite a leader in this. Hmm. Um, I like so this. You, we hopefully can encourage you know uh, companies to uh, patent things that they see are really important and core rather than just every stupid idea. Right. Uh, and in open source, we can protect ourselves to a great extent from people patenting our innovations, you know, <laughs> and giving us problems later down the road yeah. by doing this as yeah. well. It, yeah. it, so. It's kind of like putting a nice repository of prior art already well written out, so everyone can easily search it with dates and everything, and hmm. say, okay, this is the prior art. Obviously, well, this can't be patented as easily. Right, and most importantly, the we in that statement will be the patent clerk. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, the, the idea is we want to prevent patents. Um, so the Open Invention Network, OIN, has a defensive publications.org, I believe is the website. Um, they have a whole task force based around this. Um, and That's awesome. It's quite yeah. awesome. That's well, quite awesome. Quite awesome. Well, I, let's hope that helps. I, I actually want to go back to Talich just for, for one second. Um, have you guys done a lot of uh, like field testing in terms of battery life on, on the tablet running uh, Plasma Active? What are you guys seeing so far? So if you use it like a regular tablet, um, you'll get a full day out of the battery. Oh. If, if you sit there and, and uh, hammer on it with a game or whatnot, you can definitely drain it faster than that. That's not uh, bad, though. Shoot. So uh, it really depends on your usage, really okay. depends on your usage. Um, it's very much like my, my smartphone. Um, if I use it you know, for texting and phoning and I do some lookups online, it goes two or three days without a charge. Um, if I sit down and play a few of my favorite games on it, um, I, it doesn't even last me, you know, last me maybe two thirds of a day out. And, you know, I get five hours off of it or something. Gotcha. Um, I'm obviously choosing the wrong games on this phone, but <laughs> uh, so yes. so it varies. But it, we're we're saying that uh, through intensive uh, constant usage, you you need you can expect at least three to four hours of usage. Okay. If you use it like most people use a tablet, you're actually going to get a full day out of it. Okay, right. Fair, fair enough. I was kind of just kind of curious what's been going on so far. You know, um, well, be bad. Do you have any other questions? That's all for I had for me. Answered all my questions. Well, do you have anything else you want to throw out there before we let you go? Uh, before you let me go, it's like I'm caged here in a small prison. You're actually well, caged you, inside a small VLC window or yeah. a totem window. I can't uh, running, see it from Running here. under GNOME 2, yeah. which we just yeah. think is ironic and funny. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I would agree. Um, so, yeah, I would uh, ask people to follow what we're doing because um, I think it's pretty exciting stuff, both from the technology side as well as the free software side. And yeah. I think we can create big, big things here. Um, it isn't our, it's not going to be our only device we release. This is the first um, device. And we're going to be over time releasing more and more, uh, you know, devices with more features, and not just tablets as well. Uh, and the chat room's kind of going nuts, repeating the same phrase over and over again: "Replaceable battery." Uh, does it have a replaceable battery? This one does not. Okay. That is a feature that we've identified. Um, hopefully, we'll be able to to do that uh, in in future. Okay, I mean, I think it's fair enough. If you're, if you're if you're willing to get in there with if the solder gun. If you're gutsy and you, you've yeah. got the right tools. Yeah. But that's yeah. about like all mm. tablets right now. Right. Try yeah. replacing the battery on your iPad. Um, all okay. Right. Well, that, we that's it. all I got. I really appreciate you coming and taking some time out with, uh, with for hanging out with us. Yep. Best of luck with this thing. Seriously. Yeah. Can't wait to get our hands on it. Heads up when the pre-orders happen. Yeah. Or yeah. I'm going to be pissed. And we'll let the people know when we get our hands on it. We'll talk about it here on the show. So excited. All right, Aaron. Awesome. Well, thanks for coming on. Talk to you Have soon. A good day. Cheers. Later, man.
And that brings us to the end of Man, I Want That Tablet. <laughs> I know, dude, so bad. Holy crap. Oh, man, I'm excited. Oh. I want it real hard. I, I, real hard, bro. I don't even know. We've got the end of the show to do. I don't remember yeah. what to talk about. I just want the tablet. Yeah, I know. Um, oh, yeah. It's the end of the show. Yeah. We're going to do it next week. Yeah. Same bad time. Yeah. Same bad channel. Yeah. Uh, which is 1030 on Sunday or 10 a.m. on Sunday mornings. Right. We started at 1030 today because every the internet exploded. Yeah. Uh, but we re-imploded the internet. So right. it's working again. Um, let's see. JupiterColony.com. It's our forum. Mm -hmm. JupiterBroadcasting.com is a website. Yeah. Uh, you can go over to us, uh, Google Pluses and uh, the Facebooks and you know right. all that stuff. Right. Uh, that's about all that stuff. I, I want to mention this again. I'm making a game. It's a game. It's awesome. On Tuesday, right. 2299 online.com. On Tuesday, there's no mention of a game yet. People could actually go there now and you just check out the You go there now and read the webcomic, yeah. which is great. Yeah. And people, people around the world love it. But if you go there on Tuesday, there will not only be a web comic that comes out every day, but there will be a little link. Here, here's a game. Ooh. Here's a game, guys. A game. That's cool. Video game. That's and it's cool. cool. Uh, so there's that. Uh, the Illumination Software Creator contest is still running. Runs till the end of the month. Yeah. You will get a chance to win a tablet. A tablet. Uh, now, when we started the contest, we were talking about uh, you win an unnamed Android tablet. Right. Uh, it was going to be a pretty good one. Uh, I'm kind of toying with the idea of maybe doing the spark. Maybe we're doing a spark kinda instead. On the availability. I you suppose. know what? I think what I might do is I might add the option. Uh, the person who wins that particular thing, cool. I will just give them the option. I will buy you a spark when it's available. When it's available, or I'll buy you the Android tablet. What one of the two? Your choice. Maybe something like that. I'll, I'll post something and see if people are interested in that. Uh, so that'll be pretty cool. So if you want information on that, go to blog.radicalbreeze.com or my blog at lunduke.com uh, for more information on the contest. And you can pick up a illumination software creator from radicalbreeze.com. I have to say so many words in a day, dude. Uh, it, it, it is hard to get it you, out of my mouth. It's because you pick big names. You just should have called it. Why didn't I call it like Teddy or, or something? Or like Bob. That. Bob. Yeah. Go or buy roller coaster, and you could say rock and roll. roller Go buy, coaster. go buy roller coaster <laughs> over, over at radicalbreeze.com. If you buy it on the Linux, on a Linux desktop, you, you get, get like discount. you get twenty five percent off Boom. because you're running Linux. Boom. Awesome. I don't have anything else I want to say on that. That is awesome. All right. Stuff. Do you have anything to say? I just want to say I invite everybody to tune in next week. we got a big show. I'm for... so tired. I know. So uh, thanks, everyone, for tuning in this week's episode of the Linux Action Show. And we'll see you right back here next week. Oh, will we, man? If we I'm it. exhausted. Let's go take a nap. I don't think I can do another one of these. Hundred ninety six season twenty episode six. <laughs> nice headphones, by the way. Those look great no, no, on you. No, you have really no. Nice those headphones. look great. Really nice. Thank you. <laughs>